I'll just tell the, the punters what I said to you before we came on. I I um I went, we'll just be a few minutes, bro. And then I went, oh, someone who's got honorable in front of their right I, I, name. I'm not sure if we're supposed to call you, bro, but whatever. Hi, welcome. I mean, whatever you like, man. It's all good. How do you deal with that? You seem to be a pretty kind of level-headed, kind of on on the ground, ground roots kind of guy. How do you deal with all the pomp and ceremony around Parliament? Well, I just got a letter the other day actually to say that the king had uh, granted me life use of the term honourable, and I thought to myself, well, I'm never going to use that, but I appreciate it. Um, you know, like they use it in Parliament, but, like, you know, it's it's cool. Look, it's an honour. It truly was an honour to be a minister, and I hope to be again one day, um, but I'm not really into the title thing, eh? Yeah, all right. Um, not even on the old uh, email, email letterhead, don't put it there, <laughs> honourable. It's one no. of those things that probably when you need it in future life, it might be nice to have on a piece of paper, but you're not using it in everyday life is what you're saying. Oh, look, on official correspondence and stuff, I do yeah. obviously like it because I'm still in the role and and it's it's very much a parliament thing and they use it all the time and, and so we should do that too. But uh, if someone called me that in real life, I'd probably just sit in like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Where are you at the moment? Are you in Wellington? Uh, yeah, I got a we place in Batoni that I share with my uh, partner and um, just come back from a roast at the Batoni Workingmen's Club. So ready to go for another final week of Parliament for the year. So, uh, yeah. What's the feeling uh, amongst parliamentarians, MPs and ministers about old Mr Luxon kind of making you guys stay late? I kind of think a bit like school when the teacher makes you stay in a bit longer than is the norm. Are you into it? You're up for it? Are you a bit like, oh, I feel like I should be on holiday now? No, we're up for it. Eh? It's it's um it's quite good because we've got a few people in caucus that have been around the traps for a wee while. So they've been in the situation where we've gone into opposition uh, and they've seen the mistakes, I think it's yep. fair to say. And uh, we had a real good yarn the first caucus meeting back and uh, we talked about where the Labour caucus, well, I mean, let's be honest, national caucuses have made the same mistakes. Uh, they get into opposition after a stint in government and they start focusing on themselves rather than focusing on what's happening in front of them. And a couple of things happen. One, people don't trust them. If they can't get on, how can they be expected to run the country? And two, things slip by. Yeah. And they do it. Then they did it last week. We saw with um, the fair pay agreements, an absolute bloody outrage. And, uh, you know, we fought it as long as we could, but They've got the numbers and it's only a matter of time, but it was important for us to put up a fight so that people could see that this actually means something to us. We were proud of this. This was our legacy that they're trampling on. And uh, But what's more important is that working people are going to suffer as a result. They will not yeah. get better conditions. Uh, they will not get the wage increases that they would have done otherwise. And we wanted to pose the question of all the things that the national government could do, especially on the back of an election where they promised to help people with the cost of living, it says a hell of a lot that this is one of the first things they do is to prevent wage increases. So yeah. uh, a total opposite of what they campaigned on. Yeah, I, I'm interested. Why do you think Labor got nutted so badly in the election? Because, and I'll use fair pay as an argument, you know, typically older, typically whiter people vote for the other side. But it seems like they weren't even able to see in front of, you know, a foot in front of their own faces, the older whiter voter to go, now, we always talk about the next generation. That's a political thing. Now, if this guy gets in, my kids and grandkids are going to be worse off. You know what I mean? It's like, that. it seems like they didn't think that through. So what? why do you think, and I'm not trying to have, I'm not having a wake here for Labour, but in general, you know, it was a bit of a troll thing. What What, what do you put it down to? Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that, um, you know, the voters are never wrong. So I, I wouldn't presume to say that they made a mistake. They made a decision that was right for them at the time. I do think, though, that there are elements that are coming through now that perhaps not everyone was aware of. I think yeah, that's fair to absolutely. say. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it was a tough six years. Um, they probably saw as much of us as they would have done normally in nine years, and it's usually the case that New Zealanders feel that it's time for change after nine years. There definitely was a mood for change. Labour Party has to reflect on that, and we are. Um, it's. I was really pleased to see that Chris Hipkins came out and said that the manifesto is a blank page. That in itself recognises that probably didn't get the policy mix right. No. Um, but also, in the context of fair pay agreements, I think what's crucial uh, is that 
for most New Zealanders, it was a theoretical concept because it hadn't had the time to uh, bed in yet. And we know for sure that's why National are getting rid of it now because they don't want an agreement, which many are quite far through. Um, once one's settled for security guards or cleaners or supermarket workers or whatever, there's something tangible there to hang it on, eh? And, and yeah. so um, we can see the benefits of it. If they get rid of it real quick, then it just becomes this thing in theory that's uh, quite difficult to explain without something right there in front of you and quite easily to dismiss and get rid of, and that's exactly what they're doing. So in terms of lessons, uh, how do we explain that? Could we have got it in quicker? Um, and uh, those are the questions that we've got to ask because you can almost guarantee as soon as we're back, they're coming back in. They have to. And yeah. so it's already there. The work's done. We won't have to do as much as we did last time because we were creating something from nothing. We've done that work now. And that doesn't need to change. We can bring it in when we're back. And we can talk to people about that. Um, I'd like to talk to you about messaging. Um, not to, I don't want to necessarily go down the rabbit hole of relitigating everything that was done, but Three Waters is a really good idea when it comes to messaging. I just noticed in the news tonight, I watched a bit of TVNZ news, all of a sudden councils are like, we need hundreds of millions of dollars to fix up our infrastructure. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, this is where Three Waters was going to help. And all your local mayors all said to you, no to Three Waters. And that, you know, groups like, you know, Taxpayers Union Groundswell got in and, and mur murkied the water with co-governance and then it was thrown out. And now all these councils and all these ratepayers are talking about double digit increases for exactly that reason. But to the messaging, I think you'll probably agree, but most people agree that maybe that wasn't sold very well by Labour and there was a little bit of a catch up there. But the idea was solid, right? The actual idea behind what needed to be done. Uh, we've got people in our chat who are already offering to help with uh, messaging. Uh, so, 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 uh, Spider Hoof, I don't know if you know Spider Hoof off TikTok, it's a very large account, does lots of political stuff. Uh, Spider Hoof, uh, says, Karen, uh, get in early for Karen, please let me run your TikTok. Need to start it now before the next campaign. Do not wait till the last two weeks to ask for help in the last election. Love your work, uh, keeping Bish on the ropes. Um, I think what Spider Hoof is referencing is, and I don't know whether you can confirm or describe this or whatever, but both Spider Hoof and myself heard from, um, like uh, marketing people from the UK brought across by Labour to do social media two weeks before the election was to run out. And I know I've spoken to Spider Hoof and she's spoken to me and we're like, dude, we should have been doing this six months ago. So you've got these people out there to help you with your messaging. Um, and let me just get, sorry, I'm going on for too long, but let me give you the point. You talked about the fair pay agreements. When National came out during the election cycle and they said, you know, look at all these CEOs, they don't like Labour. Right, these see the CEOs are not for Labour. We here on the show we're going, yes. So now Labour needs to re-sow that traditional message that you're talking about. You can have the CEOs, we'll have the factory floor. Because that's the the origins of Labour. So what do you think about moving forward with the messaging? And you know, I can give you spider hoof details and and getting these messages out there clearer and more quickly. Because if if National did one thing well during the last election cycle, it was tailoring their messaging to point bad towards Labour. Like, for example, where are these 15-year-olds at high schools and how are they performing? They never mentioned that's highly because of the national standards they brought in in 2011, but they were able to blame Labour for it in 2023. So that, that wasn't a question really, I guess, Karen, but you can answer what I've just said. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I suppose there's a fair bit there, but uh, one, the, the social media is so important in communication, particularly political communication, um, and there's, there's no doubt there's going to be lessons from the last campaign. Uh, we were really grateful for those that came over from the UK. They got in touch and volunteered their services, and we said yes, so that makes okay, cool. the timing to some degree. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, it's no doubt that other parties utilise TikTok as, a, as an effective platform. Um, we probably didn't, but it doesn't mean we can't moving forward. Um, but messaging is everything, and the affordable water reforms was a perfect example. So it was clear when I took over local government that despite the best efforts, and I mean that, the best efforts of Nanaya Mahuta, who was just trying to prevent people from facing rate bills they didn't afford, we yeah. didn't get the messaging right. We got the, the local government sector offside because of the way that it was uh, approached to begin with, and uh, we'd lost the narrative. Um, so when I took over, I just said, to the team, right? All I want to talk about is rates because at the end of the day, that's what this is about. Let's not talk about other things. 
this is all about facing the facts that if we don't do something, rates will go up and people on fixed incomes, so retired people or low income people won't be able to afford their rates. The reality is it's actually most New Zealanders now. It's yeah. a major crisis. And um, so let's bring it back to that. Let's take on board the feedback that we got from the local government sector to, to make some changes to bring them on board. And it worked, but it worked too late. And yeah. so by the end of it, I had mayors getting in touch. The very mayors that got in touch with me when I first took over to say, we don't want this, scrap it. Then we're getting in touch and saying, hey, can we go first? Um, so, and and this is why I think National have um, uh, boxed themselves into a corner here. Because they weren't up front with people and they weren't focusing on the issue, they were scaremongering and yeah. uh, telling people what they thought they wanted to hear about maintaining local control and also um, uh, local assets, et cetera. You can't have both. You can't have local control and balance sheet separation, which is what we need to be able to do what we have to do. And they will find out very quickly. I guarantee they're getting mayors get in touch with them now saying, don't you dare repeal this because we've got credit rating agencies telling us that if we don't do this, we're in the poop. And, um, and that's starting to filter through in the news now. So I'm pretty keen to ask some questions this week if I get the chance. Yep. Um, certainly keep an eye on things because uh, just like in housing and just like in infrastructure and in roading, uh, they've promised things they can't deliver. And uh, that's not always the best approach in politics because it catches up with you. We um we sort of have a philosophy here in the show is we'll call out hypocrisy from wherever it is. But what we're doing with National at the moment, or the National Act, New Zealand First Government, is we're holding them accountable to, at the very least, the standards they held you guys accountable. And there's lots of holes there, you know, or we're holding them accountable to what they promised. And what we see, and tell, I mean, you do see this, but I, I, you can speak to this. What you're talking about is they want people, they want more Kiwis to stop smoking whilst they're making it easier to smoke. They want to support more Māori language, more te reo being spoken, while they're closing all these gaps and, you know, benefits as in uh, uh, career pathways for speaking Māori. They, uh, Mr Luxon said last week on one of the breakfast shows, they want to get rid of dumb policies that aren't working as they get rid of the clean car discount, which is not, which is basically neutral at the moment and making us a top three country in the world for take up of EVs. It's so like they're saying all these things, like they were saying before the election, they're still saying them now, but their policies they're bringing in for lots of them are kind of doing the opposite. That's at least how we see it. Oh, it's exactly what's happening. And um, uh, they've campaigned on these big, bold ideas that were packaged in a way that resonated. They really communicated well at the election, but the policies behind that and especially the policies that have subsequently been negotiated as part of the agreement, mm -hmm. uh, the coalition agreement, uh, have done the other thing. And so, so desperate for power, they've given at bigger tax cuts and New Zealand first higher spending. Uh, and now Nicola Willis is desperately running around trying to point the finger to us as to why they don't have any money. Well, there's a very simple thing why they don't have money is because they're giving tax cuts to mega landlords. Don't do that. And they'll have a bit more money. It's quite simple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it all added up before the election. Now it doesn't add up. Um, and they came under the pump at the last election for putting out a plan that quite clearly did not add up. Mm. Uh, but now they've actually reduced the revenue streams, so it doesn't add up more. Yeah, we used a clip from last week with you with uh, with the Bish, as we call him, talking <laughs> about their uh, the the inter islander ferry. Where on the same day on this on separate channels, both him and Nicola Willis were saying exactly the same thing. Like the talking points were that clear. And the one thing that the media didn't seem to pick up on the media being the interviewers at the time is when both of these people said, "For every dollar, for every dollar we spend on the ferries, it's one less dollar that we can spend on schools and hospitals and roads." But no one said to them, what about every dollar you're giving back to landlords? What about every yeah. dollar you're giving in tax cuts? That's also a dollar that you can't spend on schools and roads and hospitals. That's right. Because um, expenditure is obviously money outgoing. Once it's spent, it's spent. It's not yeah. normally ongoing, especially with infrastructure projects like the ferry. But reducing revenue is an ongoing thing. So the ferry might have been a $3 billion expenditure. But if you're giving a billion dollars away in tax cuts a year, it doesn't take long to catch up pretty quick. For sure. And, and so, you know, well, I was quite struck. You know, I was at home in uh, Wairarapa over the weekend and uh, uh, 
normally people are uh, at this time of year, straight after an election, we're coming up to Christmas. They don't really want to talk about politics. The number of times people that mentioned to me the fairies, they were just, they couldn't quite understand it. It basically went along the lines of, yeah, look, we get it. It's more expensive than what was intended, but hey, so is everything. Try building yeah. a house at the moment. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you build a house in the last two years, it's going to be a hell of a lot more expensive at the end of the project than they said it would be at the start. Um, but if we don't build them now, we're going to have to build them one day and you can guarantee they'll be a hell of a lot more expensive then. So sometimes you just got to suck it up and get on with it. And instead they're trying to spin it. And I think a pretty short term political gain, I'm not sure it's landing, but we're, we're going to be facing a massive issue on these ferries in the future. And everyone rather, whether they're right wing or left wing can see it. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, and also, of course, uh, we we kind of we talk things out on the show. And we have people in the comments also educating us, which is great fun. Um, you know, tre treating that theory like it is a road of national significance. It is the state highway, and they've promised to do a lot of work on our state highways. Yes, it's a watery one, but it, it is how the car gets from that state highway one to that state highway one. So, um, and just the idea of getting a second hand not fit for purpose is what we've always done. It just yeah, I mean, I, I, I I'm. Because it's not that they had to find three billion either, like you just said, because they'd budgeted like one point eight or two. So it's like they had to find another one. So actually, yeah. in that a year of tax cuts would have basically got them back on track. Yeah, more or less. I mean, give a take here and there, but the, the fact remains the same, doesn't it? Is that if we don't have adequate infrastructure, that carts fourteen billion dollars worth of goods between the north and the south island every year. There's a massive economic benefit to this if you yeah. do it right particularly if you invest in a brand new one that is fit for purpose, you could get 50 years out of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so spread that cost over 50 years. Yeah, sure, it's more than what we thought now. But it would be nice to see some long-term thinking uh, from this government. And it's yeah. extraordinary, I think, after what we've only had two sitting weeks of parliament. And uh, yeah, there's no shortage of things to talk about. No one wants to be in opposition that barks at every passing car, but I've never seen so many cars. <laughs> and leaks. I mean, there's a third leak today, which we might talk about very, very shortly out of that out of that cabinet room, which uh, Luxon was going, nothing gets talked about to the media. And like they've already had three pretty, uh, pretty major leaks. I I've got a question for you because my lovely Chewy, who's not with us tonight, um, he often plays the clip of you referring to yourself as a proud socialist. Elected a proud socialist. He loves that clip and he plays it a lot. So my question is, why Labour? Why are you a Labour MP and not a Green MP? What what differentiates, why did you take that, tri uh, not not saying you shouldn't, by the way, but why did you take the path to Labour rather than the path to the Greens? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the first thing to say is that um, that clip was made in the House where there's a, always a fair bit of banter and that was immediately on the back of having been called a communist, which I took exception <laughs> to. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the whole democratic socialism thing, it's literally on page two of the Labour Party values in its uh, description of itself. Uh, obviously, I believe in private property rights and, and all that sort of stuff, but I also believe that the, the state has a role and a responsibility to ensure that people live a decent life. Yeah, and uh, there are some things that the state should do and there are some things that private enterprise should do. Um, but for me... Uh, the Labour Party has always, first and foremost, looked after workers' rights, ensured that people uh, earn a decent wage for a decent wage work, day's work. And uh, so that's why I'm Labour. Um, and uh, I've got a lot of respect for the Greens, but primarily they are um, an environmentally focused party, which is very important. Yep. But when you're looking at what parties there are, um, you're never going to find one that you agree with 100% absolutely every single time but the Labour Party values are the closest aligned to mine. So that's that's right. why I'm Labour. Um, speaking of that, and this might reference something we talk about on the show a fair bit, but I'll ask uh, Lurchify's question. Lurchify says, hey, Karen, any plans for working more collaboratively with, collaboratively with the Greens to Party Māori? Do you think major party status is counterproductive? This may be coming from a place as well. I often think about, you know, um, in the US – and we talk about this on the show, this is why it might be a part of the question. In the US, the uh, uh, the Democratic Party is like the Labour Party and the Greens, but two together. Like you have your progressives and you have your centrists. Is there ever a conversation to go to this question um, that you actually go, Greens, you have that part of the political spectrum, we'll have this part and we'll work collaboratively together 
for our combined greater good? Or do you need that line of demarcation to go, we need to succeed no matter what? That's a really interesting question. Uh, and if you look at um, proportional systems in Europe, keeping in mind that ours is predominantly based on the German model, uh, you have uh, much more uh, tightly defined political parties that are quite content with 12, 15, 20% of the vote. Uh, yep. And that they have uh, an arrangement with other parties that they know that together, if they have a majority, they will work together. The same can be said for the right of politics in this country as well. And who knows, perhaps this election uh, uh, does then lend itself to that sort of approach. But that's a conversation that would have to be done internally and, and alongside the other parties. I'm not sure it's as simplistic as simply saying to the Greens, right, you focus on uh, environment, but don't touch workers' rights. Right. I mean, what right do we have to tell them that? And, verse, and conversely, what right do they have to us to say, you, <coughs> excuse me, you can't have policies on climate change because that's our gig? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not as simple as that. But it's quite clear that what's coming about from this election is that you have parties on the left and parties on the right, and whatever proportion is made up after each election, it, it's likely that they are going to work together. Sure, to party Māori work with the National Party, but I can't see that happening in the future. Uh, every three years, there are political commentators that muse about the prospect of National and the Greens working together, but we've just got to be real. That's not going to happen. Um, and if New Zealand First continue on the trajectory that they've shown over the last 12 months, I can't see us working with them either. So uh, perhaps this is an election that makes that much clearer, that right-left divide, but time will tell. Um, but ultimately, uh, what is um, clear to all of us is that regardless of particular stances on policy, there's a real determination amongst Labor, the Greens, and to party Māori to do what we can to ensure this is a, a one-term government. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's particularly interesting to see, like, a lot of times a political party will get into government with a bunch of promises, but then they'll kind of taper to the middle. I mean, I think Jacinda literally kind of did it. There was lots of us going, go on, you've got a majority, do all these things. And she said, you know, when that you guys got in with a majority, um, that she was going to be, you know, more moderate to pitch to everybody to be fair. Whereas it seems that this national and others government is, has no ambition to kind of come back to the centre once they've started to uh, actually run things. They really are pushing through all of those things off to the right that they said there were and more. It's quite surprising and shocking. Yeah, well, I, it, it depends, I suppose, on what people's motivations are. If your motivation is to uh, get into power, then you're probably more inclined to give policy concessions to those that you need to form a coalition with. Um, if your motivation is uh, to ensure that you want to make life uh, easier for working people and look after the environment and recognise totality, that's a slightly different motivation in my view. And so you'd probably land in a more policy-focused outcome as opposed to a, a concessionary or, or coalition negotiation type outcome, which is, I think is where we've landed. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the smoking stuff is a perfect example. No one campaigned on it. Um, uh, it's had widespread outrage. It's caused embarrassment for the country overseas. Um, but it's because one of those three parties wanted it. They didn't want to push back on it. They just yeah. thought that it might make it easier to get a concession on another thing. So they said, sure, have it. I bet they're regretting it now. I really do, you know. And so uh, it's just dumb. Um, but we'll just, you know, it, it's why are you in politics? We yeah. can answer that question. I'd be fascinated to hear their answer. From the inside looking out, I mean, we always speculate because we don't know. And we go like, you know, the cancelling of the uh, clean car discount. We go, oh, I wonder how much money the right received from petroleum companies. You know, and we go, the the rolling back of the smoke fare. I wonder how many donations they got from the smoking industry. Do do we Are we sniffing anything that's actually there? Or are we just kind of, you know, looking for ghosts that aren't? Who knows, man? I mean, we've got the disclosure rules in this country that that seem to, in the past, have um, picked up that sort of stuff. I I wouldn't want to speculate on that okay. um, uh, unless there's evidence that is produced and then we can comment on that. Um, 
at the moment we're focused on actually pushing back on the policies because uh, they're just very bad ideas mm -hmm. and um, and have faith in the systems that we have in this country. We could ask legitimate questions as to whether those checks and balances, those disclosure rules are tough enough, absolutely, but I would feel uncomfortable going as far to suggesting that there's a connection without anything tangible there to point to. Fair enough. That's because you'll do what you do and we do what we do. We're just mouths. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you guys can go for gold. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's more wondering because, because like with the smoking one, for example, as you say, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. So, you know, Occam's razor, take the fewest, the fewest jumps of assumptions to get to the correct answer. It's like, what is it? I can't think of a reason. The clean car, car discount is now paying for itself. What, why has it happened? I, I can't think of a reason. The clean car discount is a fascinating example. So throughout that uh, debate when that was coming into Parliament, there were National Party MPs who were putting forward amendments, and some of them weren't without merit. Um, and uh, one I know was discussed as to whether it would be possible to exempt genuine work vehicles where there was no alternative. Because right. we do know that 90% of utes aren't used for a work purpose. Right. And so, um, but there are some tradies and farmers are often used as an example uh, how about we look at a way to exempt those 10 percent of utes so we still incentivize manufacturers to fast track electric vehicles because sales of high emitting utes are going down but yep. you don't uh, impact on those uh, that need them genuinely keeping in mind it's only new utes and so 10 percent of those utes it'll be a smaller proportion because there are not every tradie and not every farmer can afford a new ute nor do they have to buy them within the next five years when the electric utes are likely to come. But that's a side argument. My yeah. point I'm trying to make is if they genuinely felt that it was because it disproportionately impacted on tradies and farmers, why wouldn't they just carve them out? And I think that's proof to me that it actually, that wasn't their motivation all along. They just wanted to get rid of the whole thing. Yeah. And there are lots of examples like this where they're just getting rid of the whole lot um, instead of actually targeting on the things that they, the arguments they use to oppose it in the first place. So my argument with the smoking thing would be, if they were concerned about the impact on dairies, i.e. the proposal that you'd have a certain number of people, yep. um, Luxon said it was one in 35 that could, in Northland that they could sell it, but turns out that wasn't uh, correct. But why don't they just look at making it more shops able to sell cigarettes, but keep all the other stuff, keep the age limits and the, reduced nicotine and all the stuff that the medical uh, experts say are going to work. But no, they just got rid of the whole thing. So that suggests right. to me it's not actually the small business owners that they're worried about. It's something else. Mm. Yes. And then the question is what? What is the other thing? Now, speaking of that, of, of closing down everything, uh, there was a leak today about politics and the, the, the big mother of all politics, putting everything together. We get a leak um, out of cabinet, I think, today. News Hub got it again. They seem to be getting all the leaks at the moment, does News Hub, um, <laughs> where they say that the evidence seems to see that almost not a single polytech can survive on its own, but they're cancelling the idea of putting them all in one, you know, one conglomerate. Um, have you have you seen the leak? Have you heard this? Have you got any thoughts around that? Well, the, the whole thing is um, there's absolutely no logic at all. It seems to be driven by um Invercargill's desire to maintain its local control over SIT just forgetting the fact that um before this um uh, reform was brought in the new Labour government at the time had to do multi-million dollar bailouts of politics because they were unsustainable yeah. there was no central coordination every uh, politic was fighting amongst themselves for the same students offering the same courses it wasn't necessarily meeting the needs of industry, which is primarily the point of a polytech. So let's actually have some coordination across the board and some financial sustainability. Um, I come from an area, live in an area where uh, our beloved agricultural training centre, Taratahi, that was a private training institution uh, that fell over and we're still trying to get it back underway. If that was at the time under the polytech scheme, that the government would have been able to step in earlier and help it out. Um, but individually, um, Polytechs are at risk. Uh, our widened upper Polytech, we're really worried about its future because it was about it was not far from going under in many people's views before the merger. 
But then you talk to the staff there, many of them after the merger would say, we're confident that we'll be able to maintain our politic. Now they're worried about it again. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it just, it makes no sense at all. And I worry that we're going to lose politics in regional areas, which is where we need these institutions the most, because the government, the national government will say to them, we don't have any money to support you because we spent it all on breaking up the, the, the reform sector. It's it's just crazy. I mean, this isn't. We shouldn't look at these things by how much they cost. We should look at these things as what they're there for, yeah. and what service they provide. Um, and and we have industries that are screaming out for trained staff. We have a massive training shortage that's facing this country when a big contingent of, of um, professionals, tradies, etc., retire soon. If we don't be smart about it and actually bring in uh, new trained people in the industries in a coordinated way, not only is it going to cost more, but we're not going to get the skilled people we need. Yeah. Hey, um, I've got a few questions coming in here and people have done super chat. So if it's cool, we'll just get to these. And can I just say to anybody else, don't no more super chats. It's a strange thing to say when you're when running a podcast, but no more super chats because if I don't get to them, I'll feel bad about people putting a couple of bucks across for a question. So if we go to these questions, and I've kind of got one more for you. Um, that can just be quick fire, though. Peter says, uh, what do you need from ordinary supporters over the next three years, Karen? I think the best thing we can all do is have conversations with people that we know. Um, and when we hear them say that uh, they're worried about the cost of rates or they're worried about what they read in the paper about their local politic or the fact that their uh, local roading project has seems to have been cancelled or delayed, talk to them about why. Mm. No one likes to be lectured, but they also like to have a conversation as a mate or a family member about what's actually happening behind it. Um, and it's a nice way to counter what they might be listening to on News Talk ZB or, or wherever. <laughs> Uh, on the talkback when people come in and express their views because we know that it's not, it's usually not left-wing people that call talkback, um, not usually anyway. But we also, you know, it's we've got to normalise the idea that tax cuts actually mean less spending. Yeah. And the roading is a perfect example. I know for a fact, because I read it myself, that there was advice from, NZTA that said that if over three years the petrol excise was not increased by 12 cents over that three years, that this, 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 and this project would have to be scrapped because there simply is enough money to do all the maintenance and do the upgrading. National aren't going to bring that in. So we know that there's going to be roading projects scrapped and we know that those communities are going to be pissed off about it. We've got to link it. We've got to link it in people's minds to say this is what happens when you prioritise tax cuts to the wealthy as opposed to investing in infrastructure. And the broader the awareness in our society, the more educated a choice and, yeah. and, and the, 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 I guess the, the more informed the conversations will be in three years' time. That, that's a little bit like what we talk about, the, uh, the achievements of 15-year-olds at school today that needs to be linked to the 2010-2011 National Party, changing it to national standards and having every educator in the country saying, in 15 years from now, these are the outcomes you'll see. And in 12 years from then, those are the outcomes we're seeing. It's linking it. It's making sure people know why those outcomes are happening. He loved Mr. Luxon loves that word outcomes. Well, that's the reason why that's happening. You did right. But also just being upfront about it as well. I just think that the, the, the clearer the communication, the, the more honest you can appear, the better because people are going to take notice. And so when if kids aren't turning up to school or aren't achieving at school, yeah, absolutely. It's got a lot to do with national standards. Yep. But don't do it in a way that makes it look like you're not um, taking any responsibility yourself because you are. You're in government. This is what we're going to do about it. It might have stemmed from this, but this is what we're going to do about it. Rather than just saying, oh, that's down to them and then not offering anything else. I'm not saying that's what we did. In that instance, we did make that point. But I think across the board in politics, you've, you've got to just be... I it, Look, this might seem simple, but I try to treat it like you'd be talking to a good mate of yours that's come up to you at a barbecue or something. Uh, you're not going to bullshit them. Yeah. You're just going to say it how it is. This is how it started. This is what we're doing about it. 
if you say it to your mate at a barbecue, why not just say it to everybody like that? No, agreed. Um, okay, a couple more quick questions here. Uh, we've sort of already checked on this, but uh, Mr. Alex wants to know, can that Inter-Islander Ferry be, project be saved at all? Is there any way you see it's being saved? Oh, there's always a chance with the weight of public opinion that a government might change their mind. Uh, I wouldn't hold out too much hope. I do hope that people make their views known on this. Perhaps a few rallies around the country at the top of the South Island or the bottom of the North Island or all across the country. Uh, hopefully they listen and change their minds, but I, I, I doubt it. Um, yeah. And it's a real shame because uh, uh, this isn't something that where the money was tucked away, ready to go. The money's been spent. There's a massive sunk cost attached here. Uh, a lot of it's commercially sensitive, but they've made a decision that's going to cost the country a lot of money yep. to, to, to fo follow through with that, not to mention the cost in the future. Um, but but uh, I, I just I hope it can, but I I, re I really doubt it. That the, they need money to um, make it look like that their tax cuts are affordable when when they're not. My um the the most amazed I was was when I heard Kiwi Rail say they might have to buy the ferry still because they're in a contract and then resell them straight away. That's that was <laughs> the thing that blew my brain most of all. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter Peter wants to know: Do you see any scenario where this coalition doesn't make three years? I, I think it's unlikely. I don't think that's ever Hang happened. On. It's, un it's unlikely not to make it, or it's unlikely to make it. Oh, I see. Yeah, sorry. I should. This is just on the back of me saying how we've got to be clear in our communication. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's unlikely that we'll see a term of government uh, shorter than three years. Right. Um, it, it's also probably unlikely that it is a one-term government. Unlikely in the sense that it's more probable that it will be more. Then it isn't, and that's just statistically speaking. It's not to say it can't happen. Um, it's just you know I've got a background in in, in stats and that, and uh, uh, the prob the probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could have an odds-on favourite that's a dollar eighty-five, or the other chance of a dollar eighty-five is a dollar ninety. So there's not much difference. It's just statistically one's more likely to happen than the other. You know. Yeah. Um, but I, I I do think that if we keep doing what we're doing and we keep working hard as a group of opposing parties. Uh, and present ourselves as an alternative that works well together. Um, there's a lot of contrast in that scenario to what's happening at the moment. Um, and put forward a policy platform that gives people hope and is credible, then, yeah, absolutely, I think this could be a one-term government. But I think it is unlikely that it would fall short of that three years. Uh, JC wants to know, uh, National Act New Zealand First will pretend to, oh, it's more of a statement that you can speak to, will pretend to come back to the centre six months before the next election. Just watch them try and fool people again. You can count on it. More of a more of a statement than a than a question. You can, do you want to speak to that? you want to share your thoughts? Well, I think this is exactly why we need to lay the foundations for the next election now and how we communicate. Um, so it, we've got many examples. The theory is just one where this is the cost of tax cuts. Um, the same be said for roading, and we'll see it play out in housing, I'm sure. The review that was announced today, I'm absolutely convinced, is about them setting the foundation so that they can pull back from the promises they made in the election. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can't leave it to the last minute to try and communicate these things. We've got to articulate that now. So, yeah. Last question from the audience is from Kiwi Skirt says, uh, what can you really do to stop the bad things happening when you don't have the majority? I guess Kiwi Skirt's probably talking about you. What can Labour do? What can the Greens do? What can Te Pāti Māori do when you don't have the majority to stop these things going through, if anything? Well, our focus is to ensure that the public know exactly what's happening and what the impact of the government's policies will be on people. It is important that we push back as hard as we possibly can and not give up because we've already seen a backtrack. You know, let's not forget that there was uh, talk about the um, bonuses for public servants that spoke to their Māori. It was because of the backlash that the government realised that they'd been found out, that they are just targeting uh, te reo speakers as opposed to bonuses across the board. And so they've changed tack on that. They can change tack on anything if the opposition is strong enough. Yeah. But for there to be a strong level of pushback from the public, it's on the opposition parties to lead that and to point things out. Um, and so there is a lot we can do. Um, 
and it's not just opposing things for opposing sake. I don't think anyone's got an interest in that because people switch off pretty quick. Yeah. Um, but we've got a job to do to make sure that the people that voted for us and the people that we represent uh, in the past and in the future are heard. Um, I think national, I think the national government have got probably a bit of a shock coming for them listening to Te Pāti Māori and others, including the, uh, you know, the Māori King, with what's going to happen over the next two or three months leading up to Waitangi Day. I think there's going to be a bit of a pushback from some of the things they've been putting through. It's going to be very interesting to to watch from the outside looking in. Hey, um, and it'll be a massive contrast to how things have been over the last six years where it's been a celebration of something special yeah. uh, as opposed to a, a lightning rod for division. And um, and if there is backlash and there is division, well, the government can look at what they're proposing and see a pretty big reason why it's happening. Yeah, but remember, Mr Luxon said he was going to bring the people together. That was their plan before the election. That's what they promised us, so uh, we'll see. Hey, uh, you spoke of it already. I'd like to know about the independent review of Kainga Order. Um, you seem, because you're you're the, uh, the representative for housing within uh, Labour, um, this independent review coming out, you have some concerns because it's coming out so close to the election. Give us your thoughts on that. My concern is that we've seen examples and we've touched on many of them tonight where the National Party, the ACT Party in New Zealand first campaigned on one thing, they promised a lot and uh, they can't deliver it. And so they need to find, in their eyes, a credible way to backtrack from that. Um, there were conflicting promises made around housing in the last campaign by by National. Um, they said they wanted to build a thousand houses, a social houses a year in Auckland, thousands more across the country, basically saying they would build more than the record number of houses built under the Labor government, plus they'll get rid of emergency houses. Uh, and by the way, they'll also sack people at Kainga Ora. It didn't quite add up. Yeah. Um, there's no way in hell that they will be able to deliver the promises they made when it comes to social housing because they're giving their money away. They're yeah. not investing it like they should be. Yeah. And so how do they backtrack from that without losing face? I think a way to do that is to have a review that asks questions and then say Kainga Ora is not up to scratch and then they'll say they're going to give their money to community housing providers. Now, community housing providers do an amazing job. They really do. But on the whole... Uh, I'll give you one it up for an example. Incredibly decent people do, working incredibly hard at our local community housing provider. The number of social houses or public houses available in it up went down because they didn't have that support from government over the nine years of the national government. We now finally have Kainga Ora back in Masterton and houses are being built again and they're working alongside the community housing provider and things are finally moving in the right direction. The, the secret to building social houses is government and community housing providers working together, not lumping it all on people that don't have the resources unless there's government support. So th this is, I'm, I'm pretty confident this is how it'll play out. They will walk back their, their commitments. There will still be people in emergency housing in three years, potentially more, and they won't build anywhere near as many houses as we did when we were in government, despite promising the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, it kind of touched on a little bit what you what you're talking about, but when I heard Nicola Willis last week, I think on um, the AM show, talking about the ferries, and she was like, "Going, we're going to get people who are experts in infrastructure around the table, and we're going to, you know, speak to other people, and we're going to get all of these." It very much sounded like a softening for either a public-private partnership or straight privatisation for Kiwi Rail. Now, you probably can't comment on that entirely because who are the people that are going to be experts in infrastructure that they're going to get around? It's like, this sounds like it could be going somewhere. Do you yourself or does the Labour Party in general have any concerns about sort of national going down, not necessarily Kiwi Rail, but in general, that selling state assets privatisation? Is that something that we should be worried about? Oh, I'd really, we have massive concerns about uh, whenever ACT or New Zealand First talk about public-private partnerships, you only need to look at Transmission the Gully to see uh, how much of a balls up they can be. Um, and uh, if they really wanted to get experts of infrastructure around a table uh, and listen to what they have to say, then they would be keeping the water reforms because every infrastructure expert within the water sphere says this has to happen. So I don't believe her at all. I think it's just something to say to make this, um, this uh, decision that is proving to be unpopular and doesn't make sense in people's minds sounds a bit better and make them look a bit better. And I don't think it's going to wash. 
to my most important question and last question for the day, Kieran. And I, I'm just so grateful you spent some time with us. I told you 20 minutes. We've been ridiculously long, and I apologize. Is so has any has anyone ever said fuck in the house? As in meaning to, not caught on a hot mic. Has there ever been a moment where someone has let out some some spectacular four-letter words in the house as a part of what they're saying in front of the microphone? Uh, I've heard it slip out and then be followed up by profuse apologies. Right. Um, and that's never been clamped down on because, you know, these, these things happen. I've never heard anybody use it in the house deliberately. I have heard someone use it in a quote, um, but not deliberately. <laughs> Clever. Yeah, Clever. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clever. Clever way I to do it. You just made me realise, I mean, my mates in particular uh, were giving me a bit of slack when I first got into Parliament. They were like, man, it's not going to be long before you're told off for swearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's an element of respect in the house uh, that, on the whole, it's, it's held up to. But um, uh, I think that's just... Uh, on the whole, what's expected in a professional environment. But yep. when you're talking to uh, people that you know well, then uh, that's less of an issue. Hey, Karen, it's our last week for the year. And uh, we spoke to people about, let's get some of our favorites on. And that doesn't mean people that we've spoken to, because we've never spoken to you, but people that we watch and we, we use their quotes and we get what you're saying in the house and we broadcast it to our audience. And this audience here loves what you're doing and can't say anything else than keep on keeping on. And um, you've been one of our favorites for this year. And I'm really thankful you uh, gave us far too much time tonight. Apologies to your partner on our behalf. I'm so sorry, um, but it's been really good. People have loved it. And I really, really appreciate you coming on. No worries, man. I'm, I was stoked to be asked. I, I enjoy your show. And um, and I think you're, you're doing a really important job because it's, it's essential that all sides of politics are represented in media and that all views are heard um, and that neither side has a disproportionate amount of airtime. And so doing what you're doing is, um, is, is pretty important, I think. And so uh, I'm just stoked to have been asked to come on and really happy to come on at a later time as well next year. Anytime, bro. Just uh, come on in. You know, you've got my details. Anytime you want to come and talk, just come and talk. And Kuki says uh, in the chat, uh, I'd proudly vote for this man. So there you go. You're, you got fans. Yeah, no, look, it, it, it's it's really quite touching um, when you, even if you don't win, like I didn't this time around, I didn't win the seat, but really stoked to be back in as an MP. But to see the number of people that do back you, um, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. So yeah. um, I'll just crack on, keep at it, be pr true to myself and, and, and see how it goes. Perfect. Hey, Karen, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Good luck for the week. Um, we'll be watching and seeing what's going on. Looking forward to some more Karen McEnulty uh, quotes out of the house maybe through the week, and we'll feature it that night and tag you back. But it's been awesome, man. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, cheers, Pat. Have a great Christmas, mate. Yeah, you too. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>